hope in the boneyard. You know, sometimes things seem hopeless. I mean, Tiger Cat fans began the season with great hope, but after a few games, there seemed to be fairly little hope. Often when a doctor voices that most awful word, cancer, the initial reaction may be one of hopelessness. Sometimes women who are in a, an abusive relationship are paralyzed from doing anything by a feeling of hopelessness. Perhaps when we lose a job, we feel hopeless. And there are other times in life where that hopelessness may come over us. Well, taken from his homeland by force and resettled in another land about a thousand kilometers away, Ezekiel was a young priest whom God called as a prophet. He ministered among the Jewish exiles, people whose lives had been devastated by the harsh and bitter realities of war. Most people had no hope of ever seeing their beloved homeland again. Most of them just plodded along with life, trying to make the best of their lot, but with little or no hope. And at one point, the Lord took Ezekiel out to a valley. And this valley was full of bones, human ones. And there God began a, a little quiz and object lesson. And the first question he asked Ezekiel was, can these bones live? Ezekiel's response was to defer to the Lord's knowledge. And then God told him to begin prophesying to the bones. Ezekiel obeyed, and an unusual event began. The bones began to move and began forming skeletons, and then tendons and flesh and skin covered those skeletons. Now there were bodies, but they were still dead bodies. Then the Lord instructed him to prophesy to the breath, commanding it to enter the bodies. Once again, Ezekiel did, and life entered the bodies, and they stood up a vast army. And then God explains this object lesson. He said to Ezekiel, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. The bones represented the apparent hopeless situation of the exiles. As a people, the Israelites believed the situation was without hope. But the Lord wanted them to know there was hope. Physically and politically, there would be a return to the land of promise. But there would be so much more to that hope. This, there was a spiritual dimension to this hope that was far more important than being back in the Holy Land. Now in this whole story, we see, first of all, that sin brings hopelessness. This valley full of bones represented the people of Israel. Their nation had been conquered, their land laid waste, much of its agriculture destroyed, and many of the people had been deported, Ezekiel among them. So things looked pretty hopeless. But all this was a result of their continued sinfulness. And God had warned them again and again. In fact, right from the beginning, when he gave the law to Moses, he warned them. Listen to what he said in Deuteronomy 28. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you will not understand, a fierce-looking nation 
without respect for the old or pity for the young. They will devour the young of your livestock and the crops of your land until you are destroyed. They will leave you no grain, new wine, or oil, nor any calves of your herds or lambs of your flocks until you are ruined. They will lay siege to the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. They will besiege all the cities throughout the land the Lord your God is giving you. Then the Lord will scatter you among all nations from one end of the earth to the other. That was the warning God gave them right at the beginning if they continued to rebel and sin against him. And as it did for the people of Israel, sin continues to bear the fruit of hopelessness. Oh, it may seem like fun and fulfillment for a time, but eventually those who follow the paths of sin have a lack of hope. Consider the singer Glenn Campbell, who rocketed to fame with hits like Gentle on My Mind and Wichita Lineman and Rhinestone Cowboy, winning Grammys in both country and pop categories, and even hosting his own TV variety show. But with that success, Glenn began abusing alcohol and drugs. His marriage failed and his personal life was a mess. Things seemed pretty hopeless. But then <clears throat> when there seemed to be no hope, he turned to Jesus Christ. Secondly, we see in this passage that God's promise of new life. This prophetic promise was looking at two things. First, it was a promise of new life politically, a promise of a return to the land of Israel. And that promise began to be fulfilled in 538 BC, less than 50 years after this experience of Ezekiel's took place. You see, in 539, an alliance of Medes and Persians had put an end to Babylon. And a year later, Cyrus gave permission for the Jews to return to their homeland. And this they began to do. And while they did not have political independence, there was a much greater freedom and there was hope. The people had a sense of new life. But more importantly, this prophetic word looked ahead to the coming of Jesus. Since sin had been the reason behind the exile, and sin is also the reason for our spiritual death, God promises a resurrection from the deadness of sin that could be accomplished only through Jesus Christ and his sinless sacrifice. As Paul writes to the believers in Coloss, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. Yes, we were dead in our sins, but through Christ, those graves are opened and we are brought out of them as Ezekiel prophesied. Glenn Campbell found new life in Christ. And when his life was changed by Jesus Christ, he said, I simply am the new Glenn Campbell. You see, God has made a practice of changing dry bones into new life. Another example is Carla, who, though attending church as a child, had ignored and rejected God for many years. And then in her early 30s, with her husband fighting a losing battle with cancer, and life was a struggle. And her husband, Ben, went to church one Sunday with his uncle. And he asked Jesus Christ to forgive him and come into his life. Two weeks later, Carla went to church with Ben, rather against her will. But God spoke to her heart also. And she repented and received Jesus as her Savior. And everything changed for her that night, she says. Ben did die the next year, and she struggled through intense grief, but God was faithful. And eventually, she met and married Kevin and continues to grow in Christ. And then we see, thirdly, that God promises an empowered life. 
You see, he not only promised to give them life, but promised them his spirit who would empower them to serve him as they ought to. As he stated in chapter 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And through Jeremiah, God had promised, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. The dry bones Ezekiel observed received the breath of God and then stood to their feet a vast army. They were empowered by the Lord. And Ezekiel describes them as a vast army, conveying the image of power and the ability to conquer whatever stands in their way. When we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we have the power to conquer temptation and the challenges of, that come into our lives. Jesus told his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And Paul urges us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Herbert Jackson told as how as a new missionary, he was assigned a car that wouldn't start without a push. But he developed a routine of either getting children to help push his car or parking it on a hill or leaving it running. And he used what he thought was this ingenious procedure for a couple years. And then ill health forced the Jackson family to leave. And a new missionary came to the station uh, before they uh, departed. And Jackson was proudly explaining how he had this uh, arrangement, you might say, for getting the car started. While he was explaining it, the new man opened the hood and looked underneath, and before the explanation was complete, he interrupted and said, why, Dr. Jackson, I, I believe the only trouble is this loose cable. And he gave the cable a twist, tightening it all up, he stepped into the car and pushed the switch, and to Jackson's astonishment, the engine roared to life. For two years, needless trouble had become routine. The power was there all the time. Only a loose connection kept Jackson from putting that power to work. J.B. Phillips paraphrases Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, how tremendous is the power available to us who believe in God. When we make firm our connection with God, his life and his power can flow through us. The Lord has made his power available to us, but all too often we have this poor connection. Being filled with the Holy Spirit allows that power to flow from the Lord to us uninterrupted. There are times in life when things look rather hopeless. But Ezekiel found that when God is involved, there is nothing impossible. Young Mary heard those same words from Gabriel when she was told she would be the mother of the Messiah. And she wondered how that would happen since she was a virgin. The angel explained that the Holy Spirit would come upon her and cause her to become pregnant and reminded her that with God, nothing is impossible. And so as God brought to life those bones in the valley, so he can work to restore our lives in the hopeless, from the hopelessness of sin to the life and power of life in Christ. And just as the Holy Spirit did come upon Mary and enabled her to become pregnant and she gave birth to the Messiah, so God through his spirit can empower us to live lives that bring honor and glory to the Lord. So regardless of our situation, let us seek God's help and power. There is hope in Christ. 
And just as God's spirit breathed life into those reassembled bones and sinews and skin in Ezekiel's valley of dry bones, so also Jesus coming over 2,000 years ago brought hope to people living in the bondage of sin. And Jesus gives hope today. When we reflect on his coming, born in a barn in Bethlehem, it is a time of hope. Jesus gives hope. Let's put our trust in him.